All right, Matthew chapter 17. A little update on where we are. We are quickly heading towards the cross in Jerusalem. It's later on in Jesus' ministry. These are critical times in the training of the twelve. And they're still likely in the area of Caesarea Philippi. Now remember with me, prior to this, everywhere Jesus would go, even into, even into places that were not even Israel, uh, modern day Lebanon area, he was recognized and he was thronged with crowds that wanted healing. And, and, and he was feeding Gentile crowds that wanted healing, as well as Jewish crowds that wanted healing. And, and so he, he, he took them away to this pagan place where they didn't much care about who he was in order to intensely minister to his disciples. But we know at this time, and Luke records in this particular uh, grouping of stories at, the, at this time, it says in Luke 9.51, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. It was coming, he knew it was coming, and he wasn't holding back, and so he was on his way to Jerusalem, as we will see in the next few weeks. So verse 10 reads this, and his disciples, Matthew 17, 10, asked him saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So Jesus had just been up on the mountain praying with Peter, James, and John. And while they were up on the mountain, Jesus was glorified. And he was transfigured. And appearing in front of Peter, James, and John, you had Moses and Elijah. We talked extensively about that last week. The law and the prophets from the Old Testament, those that represent the law and the prophets, were there ministering to Jesus in, in transfigured new body form. And as they, they came down the mountain, this logical question makes sense now, doesn't it? It wasn't just out of the blue because they saw Elijah. And they're saying, Jesus, you've already come. Now, I thought Elijah was supposed to come before you. And so that's what's happening here. It's a theological question. Now, they knew that Elijah was supposed to come before the coming of Jesus because of the prophecy of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament that was known as Scripture. He's the last known major prophet to the Jewish nation before the appearance of John the Baptist 400 years later. So these are good Jewish boys, and they would know the prophecies of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, we actually looked at this on Wednesday night. Malachi 3, 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger. Now here it doesn't say Elijah. It says my messenger. And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. So that messenger is Jesus himself. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And so someone's going to come as, as a, a preparer of people prior to the appearance of Jesus. Now understand, in those days, no telegraph, telegrams, no real mail system. It was pretty sketchy. Um, most people got their news through traders that were moving around the area. And so if you had royalty that was going to go and visit a place, you had to send a precursor to set it up. Why? Because you couldn't make online reservations with Motel 6. It just didn't happen back then. Right? And so you always had to, and, and if someone, so the king of the universe is coming to earth in the form of a man. And before his ministry takes place, you send a form runner to prepare the way. And so that's what's happening here in Malachi. And so, the, so John the Baptist, I think, came specifically as my messenger. And then it says in, in uh, 4 or 5 in Malachi, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I think that is speaking of specifically Elijah himself. Now, we're, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but Elijah shows up ministering to Jesus on the top of the mountain right before this. Okay? Verse 11 goes on, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming. Even though you saw him up in the mountain, he still is coming, and he will restore all things. And so, again, I believe before the second coming of Jesus Christ, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, 
Not the first time that he came to rescue men from themselves. And he came on a donkey, an animal of peace. Next time he comes, he's going to come on a war horse. And he's going to come redeem everything to himself. And he's going to rescue everything that belongs to him. And so before the second coming, Elijah himself will make an appearance. And so the first messenger, I think, is referring to John. The second one is Elijah. But it goes on to say in verse 12 in Matthew 17, but I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but they did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. And so the, the leadership took Elijah and put him to death for telling the truth, right? Why did Jesus die? For telling the truth, right? It says in verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was an initial fulfillment of the Elijah prophecy and a, a full fulfillment of the messenger in Malachi 3.1. But understand this, biblical prophecies often have double fulfillment, a sooner fulfilling and then a later fulfilling of the same prophecy. Now, for example, on Christmas, we do, you know, for unto us a child is born and the government shall be on his shoulders and he shall be called wonderful counsel. In there's also mighty God. So Jesus comes as a child, but then later he is going to run the full government of earth and be recognized as mighty God as well. And so there's a double fulfillment in that simple prophecy. It's something you can look up if you're a Bible buff and, and you think about these things. It's, it's an amazing thing to look at double prophecies, and there's many throughout the scriptures. And so even though John the Baptist comes as the first messenger, he is also a partial fulfillment of the Elijah prophecy. And so when John the Baptist's father was was serving in the temple, an angel appeared to him, right? He was a priest, John the Baptist's father. And it says in Luke 1, 17, he, speaking of your son that's being born to you in your old age, will also be, come before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah, right? So your son that hasn't been born, he's going to come, and he's going to be like Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so this was a prophecy to John the Baptist's father about his ministry. And so John the Baptist did come and prepare a way for the Lord. What was the major thing he did? He humbled people. Understand this. You might, you might struggle with pride, but if you're saved... One thing you had to do to get saved is humble yourself. At least a little bit at one point in time in your life, if you are truly saved, you had to say, God, I can't do this. I need your help. Right? That's the salvation prayer. Whatever words you add to it is, God, I'm giving in. I can't do it. I have to fully trust in you to get me into heaven. And so that's what John the Baptist did. He challenged the people. He said, repent, turn. And again, they're thinking, we're Jewish, we follow the law, we're good people, we go to festivals, whatever. We kosher, that kind of thing. And, and my, my children are lawyers, whatever, you know, <laughs> the, whole, the whole Jewish thing. But they thought they were good enough, but their hearts needed to be humbled. And so he baptized them, when he was baptizing them, he was baptizing them in the Gentile baptism of conversion to become a Jew. Even though they're already Jews, they were humbling themselves and saying, I'm like a Gentile. I still need salvation. And that's what John the Baptist did, right? And so he prepares the way for the Lord. And it says he will come, this prophecy to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was he will come in the spirit or the air, by implication, the disposition or the attitude of Elijah the prophet. Was Elijah zealous? You couldn't stop that guy, right? He prophesied and prophesied under threat of death all the time. He had groups of men coming after him. He had armies coming after him to kill him. <laughs> he called fire down from heaven and torched them all. But yeah, he, he was a zealous guy, right? He rebuked high-ranking authority. Did John the Baptist do that? The king, right? He called sinners to repentance. He attracted multitudes in his ministry. He caught the negative attention of the king. 
They both did, right? He lived a simple life, had simple trappings. And he fled and lived in the wilderness at times. And he lived amid great corruption and was called to challenge it. And so he came. John the Baptist and Elijah are the same in these ways, and you can even look up more. But again, here's the scenario. John the Baptist had come before Jesus. By this point, he's dead. He's been killed by the king. And then all of a sudden, they see Elijah on the mountain. And then they ask the question, I thought Elijah was going to to come before. But he didn't come before. He's come after you came, Lord. And what did Jesus say to that? He said, he will come. He will literally come again. And so there will be an an appearance of Elijah himself before the Lord comes. Now, the problem with interpreting prophecy is so often, if we don't understand it, we give it our own meaning. And watch out, because you can read many books where everybody says, this is the way it's going to be, period. Listen, the Bible's going to be fulfilled 100%, but maybe not your thoughts on what it actually means, right? But we get this concept in our head how it will work. So understand this. When, when the Bible talks about a future time working with the nation of Israel, people that lived before 1948 never conceived that Israel could ever exist. And so they're trying to figure out all these prophecies and these promises to Israel. But Israel doesn't exist. They don't have a homeland. They're scattered all over the earth. People are calling themselves Jews, you know, but the temple was burnt down. All the records of their genealogies were taken out in 70 AD by Titus, the Roman. You know, they they can't exist. Therefore, in my mind, I'm going to think, well, of course, it has to be fulfilled. Maybe it'll be fulfilled through the church. And so Israel no longer exists, but the church does. But that doesn't work because Israel was always tied to the land. Oh, yeah, but that's the land of the Christians now. You know, and so everything has changed because they're, they're viewing it the way that they see it. And I can understand that. But then 1948 happened. And a British territory known as Palestine was given to the Jews for a safe place for them to land after the Holocaust. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I've been interpreting all these as being my view of them. But now literally they're being fulfilled. And the problem we have with prophecy is we don't believe how it will literally be fulfilled. Now, when I talk about the book of Revelation, it hasn't literally been fulfilled yet. So I still think it's future. Now, when I read it, it's interesting and and I can surmise what might happen, but I don't divide the church on my interpretation of what I think that God's going to do. But when we look back on the book of Revelation from heaven, we're going to understand, God, you nailed it 100 percent because God is able to communicate what he means and he says what he means. And so we, we normally fail when we don't believe prophecy enough. And so literally it says, and Jesus says, Elijah will. He's come, but he's going to come. Not this coming he just saw on a mountain, but he's going to come. Well, why do I say that? Well, I believe there will be an appearance of Elijah himself before the Lord comes. We looked at this last week. We actually looked at it on Wednesday night as well. Funny how the Bible all fits together, because we're in the Old Testament on Wednesday nights. (laughs) But... In Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 to 6, and remember the tribulation period is a time where God is focusing on the nation of Israel. He's focusing on his people. Uh, Another name for the time of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, is called a time of Jacob's trouble. The Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles is over, and God is again working with the Jews to bring them to the knowledge of their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Jewish scripture. And so he's going to bring them to this point. So what does he do? He sends two witnesses into the tribulation period who live for three and a half years preaching daily where? In Jerusalem to reach the Jews. Now for sure they're on the internet too. You know you can find them on YouTube if it, if it exists in that day. I don't know but they'll be there. The world will see it and the world would be witnessed to by these men preaching their Messiah Jesus Christ. And they're protected. And like Elijah could call down fire to protect himself, these two men have the power to protect themselves by fire. Elijah, by turning water to blood. Moses, by calling all types of plagues down on the people. Moses, by holding back the rain and causing a drought. Elijah. And so these men are protected for three and a half years ministering to the Jews in Jerusalem during this time. Revelation chapter 11, spark your curiosity, go read it. (laughs) Okay. Okay. 
And so they were famous for these things. We also know that, that Elijah himself did not die. You know the term chariots of fire, you hear that? That's from Elijah. Elijah was carried off into heaven through a chariot, by a chariot of fire. He never died. And, and so he's going to come back. He also appears, last week we looked at the transfiguration, on the mountain with Jesus to encourage Jesus prior to him going to the cross. What about Moses? Moses did lie, or die. He, he, he died on Mount Nebo, didn't he? Okay? But they've never found his bones, even though it's described where his tomb would be. Why? Well, in Jude chapter 1, it's a one chapter book, but we'll say chapter 1, verse 9, through the Holy Spirit, Jude just lets this slip out. Right? He says this, yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses. Why would you dispute about the body of Moses? Well, God had use of him. One of them is at the transfiguration. I believe the second thing he has use of him for is during the tribulation period, right? And they dared not be against him uh, reviling accusation. So talking about Michael the archangel, not just taking on another angel, uh, but but trusting in the Lord for that, right? Because sometimes I'm going to kick Satan in the face. Don't say that. Pray the Lord kick Satan in the face. You don't got power to kick Satan in the face, right? And that's kind of what that is saying here, okay? But the idea is that he just, they disputed over the body of Moses. Isn't that interesting? I think God still has use of him. And so you got Moses and Elijah. And so Jesus says, literally, this is going to be fulfilled. And so they understood, oh, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah the first time. And Jesus says, he's also going to come the second time. Now, we're going to shift gears in verse 14 as we move forward. It says in verse 14, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And so as they're starting to leave this place, word comes out, and here comes the crowds again. Right? Right? And uh, I want you to note, because it's a pattern in our lives, Jesus, right before this, was where? Up on the mountain in glory, being transfigured. Oh, what a place. Peter didn't want to leave. He wanted to build a tabernacle to all of them. Let's hang out here. Never want to come down from that that mountain. And he comes into the valley, and what does he run into? We're going to see he runs straight into a demon, right? Very often, if, if men are at a men's retreat... You know, we just pray for the wives that they're not demon in a skirt when they get home. <laughs> and likewise, when women have a retreat, we pray, <laughs> you know, that you don't got devil in boots at home waiting for you, you know, and because it's very common. We had highs and we hit lows. But understand this, Jesus also did. And the reality is it's not how high you fly, it's how you walk when you hit the ground, right? And so we are going to go through highs and lows with the Lord this side of heaven. In heaven, it's all highs. <laughs> but the side of heaven, we're going to have the highs and the lows. And so he comes to him, and he, and he says, my son, he's an epileptic. Now, he's not a young man, as we see, we'll see later on. So he's this older, older young son, and he, he calls him an epileptic. And some of your translations would, would call him uh, a, a lunatic. It might say that. Now, the idea behind that is that, that during a, a full moon, and, and we still see it today, that, uh, that for whatever gravity poles or whatever's going on in the earth, because of the, the gravity is much higher once you have a full moon, because the sun and the moon are now lined up with the earth, right? And it might have something to do with the fluid in your body or whatever, but things get a little crazier at, at full moons, as, as people have done the studies and all. And so um, when someone was... Uh, would have a, a struggle or a seizure or something like this, it would be connected to the, the moon, or they would call him a, a, a lunatic, right? And that became adapted to someone that's just crazy, right? Now, you need to understand that many times physical ailments can be mistaken for demonic uh, possession. And at other times, uh, people will blame it on a demon, even though it's just something physical, right? Right? 
And so you just don't know. When you're dealing with someone that's struggling with mental illness, you pray for spiritual uh, uh, protection over them. And if spirits are involved, because very often they are involved, even though it's a physical ailment. Why? Because Satan's going to take advantage of every weakness we have anyways. Right? So never, ever forget the spiritual element when you're dealing with, with a physical ailment. Okay? Um, I do have some training in, in mental health and, and, and counseling um, and, and some certifications in uh, that area. And so I, I've studied a, a, a little bit, and I do understand that, that you know, you, you have a disease called schizophrenia, right? And some of you may struggle with it, probably a, a few of you. So, and, and what it is, it's, it's your mind talking to you, right? Now, it's interesting because... In the Lord, that's an awesome thing because the Lord has an easier avenue to speak to you, right? And, and I find that very, very often people can be prophetic that might have a little bit of, of schizophrenia. The hard thing is if you do or you know someone that does, you have to have people watch you too because Satan has that ability to speak into your mind as well, right? And so just be careful of that because that's a reality. That's a physical malady that can also have a spiritual component easy, right? My wife is dealing with anxiety. So what's Satan trying to do to my wife right now? He's trying to pour the lies into her. You're never going to get better. You're not going to see your grandchild born. But, but, you know, just trying to. And so we're, we're praying all the spiritual protection, even though my wife inherited what's going on with her from her own father. And that's very common when you deal with what my wife has. Okay. And so they're, they're mixed together. Okay. Now, this man is confusing epilepsy with demon possession, which is easy to do. Okay, but we know because Jesus casts out the demon that his epilepsy was actually caused by a demon. So again, you always pray, whether it's fully physical, you pray for the protection from the spiritual, and it may be fully spiritual that is affecting the, the, the physical. And so back and forth, just pray. <laughs> That's the point. Just, just deal with it and say, Lord, keep us from the evil one. And then Mark would record, uh, record also about the same incident that the boy would become rigid, clench his teeth, and foam at the mouth. And so what was the demon doing in this young man? He was trying to get him to commit suicide. And, and why would Satan's influences want to, want to cause that? Because God loves human beings. And Satan, therefore, hates human beings. Because Satan hates what God loves. Okay. And so this influence is, is taking place on this boy. In verse 16, the man says, I brought him, because he's, he's suffering, I brought him to your disciples, Jesus, but they could not cure him. Now, as parents, we want nothing but the best for our kids, right? But sometimes when we bring our kids to a doctor or a specialist or a counselor, they don't get the help they need. So what do you do? Just give up? No, because you love your children and your loved ones, you just don't give up. You're just going to push through everything you possibly can because until they're better, you're just, you don't quit, do you? And so that's what this man is doing. And so what did he do? Ultimately, he brought him to Jesus. Best thing you could ever do. Now, there is a clear teaching on this, and I'll, I'll hit it quickly. But the lesson is clear to parents. Bring your kids to Jesus. It's good that your kids get a good education. It's nice that they learn how to play with others on team sports. You know, it's, it's good that they have a roof over their head. But listen, as a parent, the most important thing you could ever do is bring your kids to Jesus. You know, they don't need a 5,000 square foot house and have their parents be absent all the time. They need loving parents that are going to bring them to Jesus. That is the most important thing that you could ever do for your children is to bring them to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if you've noticed, if you've raised kids, they're little sinners. Why? They're your children, and you're a sinner. <laughs> they got what you got, right? But we, you know, the, the world says today, let them figure it all out themselves. Baloney. Baloney. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And understand this. If they reject God, let it be despite your efforts, not because of your lack of effort. If they rebel against God, let it not be, or let it be despite you, not because of you. And so just a, an admonition to parents, what, whatever it looks like with your kids, take the word of God and apply it in your unique way to your children and raise them up as much as you can and bring them to Jesus. 
Verse 17 goes on. So the man says, your disciples couldn't heal him. And Jesus answered, he doesn't say what you're, you, you expect him to say, but he says this, and it might sound mean. We'll talk about that. He says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Wow. This, is, this dad's hurting. And, and Jesus refers to him as faithless because he says, not these faithless disciples, he says this faithless generation. Anybody. He's talking about everybody there. You need more faith is what he's saying. You don't have enough faith. He's talking about everyone. They all, we all, still need more faith. Now, is Jesus being mean? Listen, sometimes you just need to be clear and straight to the point. We can, like for me, my problem is sometimes I try to be so tactful that you don't get the point. And sometimes you just need to say it, Right? And this man is hurting for his son, but still needs to learn the, most, the more important things. His son could be healed, and he can walk off and just not be saved, right? But Jesus is bringing the most important things. And understand this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What does that mean? It means if you have people that love you enough to confront you, and you're willing to hear it, you're going to be better off, right? A lot of times in churches, you know, you got to have elders to keep that pastor accountable. Guys, elders aren't to keep the pastor accountable. Elders are to minister to the people. That's what the Bible says. So who keeps the pastor accountable? Anybody that loves the pastor. You don't have to have a title, a position, or whatever. But if you love me, I'm going to listen to you. If you don't love me, I'm like everybody else. I'm going to just blow you off. <laughs> Forget it. Isn't that true for all of us? And if you love people enough to give them the hard words, you actually love them. Now, so I receive it. People close to me will tell me. Now, they're not always 100% right, but I want to say, Lord, I want to learn. I want to learn from this situation. And normally, there's a seed of truth in there at least. And many times they nail it, right? But faithful are the wounds of a friend. This doesn't give you permission just to go wipe everybody out. I'm going to go call my sister and be faithful with my, <laughs> my wounds. You know, don't do that. That's not using the Bible uh, properly. You want to speak the truth in love. Don't forget the second part of that statement. And Job says this, he bruises, but he binds up. He bruises, but he binds up. He wounds but he makes hands whole. And that's what Jesus is doing here when he says this faithless generation. Now verse 18 goes on, it says, and Jesus rebuked the demon. He didn't, he didn't heal the sickness. He actually rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured, cured that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for as surely I say to you, if you have faith, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And so it seems that this boy was not healed yet because people had the failure to trust in the Lord. It was a lack of faith. Now Mark tells us that Jesus was encouraging the man to trust and to have faith. So Mark 9 Verse 21, he asked the father saying, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Now, I want to stop there. I just think it's hilarious because these are young men, right? Peter was up on the mountain with Jesus when the other nine were down trying to heal this, this young boy and they couldn't do it. So Peter um, gave Mark the information that Mark could write down. So that's why the gospel of Mark is so clear because it's, it's Peter's account. And so Peter gives a lot more account because he wasn't failing at this point. Matthew, not so much. He was one of the nine, right? That couldn't cast out the demon. Anyways, that aside, this is a little bit more detail in Mark about the same situation. How long has this been happening? And he said from childhood. So he's older now, obviously. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father's child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. 
a little more detail. Now, the beautiful thing about this is the man was not offended right off the bat. He didn't argue with Jesus going, but don't you know how many times I go to synagogue? He didn't do that. Well, who, who do you think you are? Like we do, right? We get all defensive. He was listening with a heart to learn. Don't get defensive with God. He loves you more than you love yourself. He cares about you. He didn't attack Jesus back, challenging his level of faith when he was called a faithless generation. He humbly asked for help. Listen, so many today, even in the church, do not feel that God or his word has the right to correct their error or sin. God doesn't have the right to do that. So if I'm struggling with same-sex attraction, God, you don't have the right, and I'm just going to ignore your scripture. If you're struggling with greed, it's just ambition. You know, if you want to, uh, you know, divorce your spouse for, God, you want me to be happy. The Bible never says that. The Bible says you want to be holy. He wants you to be holy. And that means obedience. Right? And, and we just change the word of God at our whim because we don't really want to be corrected by it. We want all the comfort. We don't want any of the correction. Therefore, we end up judging God and his word instead of allowing it to transform and cleanse us. Minimizing the truth of the Bible minimizes the maturity of the believer every time. And we wonder why the church in America is getting weak. Because the church is compromising to be accepted by the world. The world is not going to be in heaven. Don't love the world or the things of the world because they're not of God, guys. And so it is clear that Jesus is concerned about this man's faith, but he's also certainly concerned about his disciples. In a sense, his legacy as they're going to bring forth the message to the world. He's trusting them with that. And so he deals with them and he says to them, if you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. Guys, it isn't about moving a mountain. People focus on that. I want to move a mountain. I got faith. Move. Oh, see, the Bible's not true. It's an example to say that whatever God wants you to do, if you trust in him, he will do it as it is his will, period. And guys, harder than moving a mountain is turning a sinner into a saint because God spoke mountains into existence and he had to die to save you. That is the incredible greater miracle that he can even transform us. So this is an example of the great things God can do if you trust in him. But so often we're focused on the problem and all we can see is a demonic boy. Like Peter, he was focused on Jesus and he started to look at the waves and what happened? He started sinking. We've got to learn to keep our eyes on Jesus and off of the problem. Now, I want you to understand, faith in of itself is not a power. Because you can have faith in a tooth fairy, but it ain't going to get you anywhere. And you can have a lot of faith in a tooth fairy. And all you get is a quarter or a dollar or five dollars. I don't know what you get nowadays. My kids are older. <laughs> I, I wish I was still getting money. I'm losing teeth like crazy now. <laughs> but buy a new car. No, just kidding. Um, anyways. But faith... In itself, it's not a power. You got to believe in a powerful thing with that faith. And that's what makes it powerful. Empty faith is not a force that has an effect. Faith is about trusting God, trusting in an almighty God. He has the ability to do it. So now faith, and I would say Hebrews 11, by implication, faith in God is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is saying, God, you can do it. Even though I don't see it, I don't see the end of it, I trust in you that you can do it. And so that trust in God is extremely powerful. So in verse 21, Jesus makes this statement. However, this kind, this demon, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now let's get logical about this again. The insinuation is that there are some kinds of things that require stronger faith than others. Because I want you to note, Jesus 
casts out the demon, and he didn't say, wait a second, sir, let me pray and fast for a week, and then I'll heal your, heal your son. What did Jesus do? He cast out the demon right away, no problem. So he isn't saying prayer and fasting is a technique by which you cast out demons. He's saying something else. What is he saying? Well, strong, current, up-to-date faith today is what you need when you're confronted with a powerful trial, even a demon. Your faith up-to-date today, current, is powerful, right? So when dealing with demons, you cannot have only a Sunday morning faith. You can't be a Christian for a few hours once a week and expect to be a powerful Christian once you face a trial, right? You need to have a 24-7 walk with God, and then you're going to face trials better. So the next time a demon-possessed person is brought to the disciples, they're not supposed to tell them, oh, we, we need four days of prayer and fasting for this one. Come back in four days. They need to be ready on the spot. And Jesus himself, again, did not have to pray and fast in order to cast a demon out. Why? Because he's up to date, right? Well, he's God in the flesh, but he's up to date in a sense. So prayer and fasting are not the specific answer to the immediate situation. It is the power of God and your faith at the moment. And so you need to be up to date in order to handle the situation. Now, as I looked further back and meditated on this particular passage over the years, I think the disciples were trying to cast out the demon in their own strength. Why do I say that? Because they're just like me. They had this experience. Remember, Jesus had sent them out and saying, you can cast out demons, you can heal people, you know, do this. And you have to trust in me. Don't take any money. Don't, don't send ahead, you know, for reservations for the hotel. Just trust that I'm going to provide. They're scared to death. And they go out, and what happens? They come back with all these stories of these amazing things that they're able to do. And they start thinking, I'm somebody. Are they anybody? No. With the Lord, they're somebody. With the Lord's power, they're somebody. But they forgot to plug into the, the source. And so they think, I got this. Hold my Bible. I got this, you know? But they can't do it without Jesus' power. And so they weren't up to date with their prayer and fasting. They weren't up to date with their spirituality. And so prayer, understand, keeps you charged up. Remember, John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Up to date with me, close to me, and I'm going to guide you and you're going to do incredible things. On your own, absolutely not. You're just a, you know, animated, walking, hydrated piece of dirt, right? That's all we are, you know? We're the elements of dirt and we're, we walk around, we're sinners, we're messed up. But with Jesus, we can do powerful things. So you need to be up to date with Jesus. And prayer keeps you charged up. You know, on our, our counter at home, you know, and this is, just frustrates me. Why can't we come up with a universal plug? I don't know. <laughs> right? Every, everything has it. Now it's, now it's a C plug. And then you have the lightning plug. And then before that, you have the other one. You know, and you have all these plugs. And then you have the one that's thinner. And then you have the one that's wider. And I have all of it in my house. And so I have all these wires everywhere, replugging in them to the adapter to plug into the wall to charge things. But everything needs power. But the thing is, a Christian needs power. Now, our, our, our heater went out a while ago. Uh, right when I got cold, we turned it on, ran for a few minutes, and then it stopped. And the problem was the blower. We, we recently got it fixed, right? A, a young man from our church just changed something on the control board, and now it works. But for a while, we were plugging in space heaters when it would get cold. You got to make sure when you're plugging in space heaters in a house that's 70 years old that you don't plug two space heaters into the same circuit. What happens? You know, I got a panel inside the house, a panel outside the house, and I'm always walking back and forth because I keep on doing this, right? But understand, when you're plugged into the Lord, he never goes, he's got all the power you could ever need for any situation. So when you're trying to plug into the Lord, it's never the Lord's fault. It might be the adapter, it might be the cord, it might be your battery, but you got to deal with it practically in your life in order to plug in with the Lord. What does that mean? Prayer is one of those things that makes sure you're connected to the source, right? And the source of your spiritual power will never trip 
He's always faithful. And your supply is endless as long as the way to get from the wall to your battery is in good working order. Plug into the source. Now, another thing about praying in like this situation, and, and this, this fits in with what Jesus is saying to these, these disciples, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves only praying in a panic. A problem comes up, and that's the only time you ever pray. But that's not a good time to learn how to pray in a panic. Now, listen, it's not wrong to pray in a panic. That's the right thing. The first place to go is the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. It's wrong when you pray only when panicked. So it's better if I've cultivated a life of disciplined prayer. Now, I, I enjoy swimming. I grew up as a swimmer and played water polo and did all that. I was a lifeguard the whole shot, and I still surf today. But I love to swim, and I go to our city pools and swim a couple times a week. I love it. But it's good if I'm going to go surfing on a large day to be in shape rather than trying to train when I'm caught in a riptide. Now, for sure, it's training when you're caught in a riptide, but it's way better to be trained up before you get caught in that riptide. It's better to go to boot camp before you go to war. And that's what he's saying. Prayer and fasting brings you to that place. And so a healthy prayer, uh, have a healthy prayer life, and it will be healthier for you when you desperately need it. You're ready to go. Great story here. Acts 19, 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And so these men were spiritual, but they didn't know Jesus. And so they wanted to go, well, Jesus is casting out demons, and this is kind of my role, so maybe I'll use that power because that seems to work way better than what I got. And so they would say this, we exercise you or we cast out the demon in you by Jesus of whom Paul preaches. Not good results when, it's, when you're not the one plugged into the source. I'm saved because Aunt Mabel prays for me. No, you got to be saved because you're praying to God yourself, right? So it goes on. There were also seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. Hey, my dad's a priest. I can cast out demons. Who did so? Did this very same thing. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who in the world are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I love that story. Seven guys were beat up by one guy, stripped naked, and they're running around naked. And if you grew up in the 70s, people used to like to streak back then. Streaking did not start in the 70s. It's a biblical concept, but please don't do it around me. <laughs> they weren't plugged into the source. That's the point. That is the point. What about fasting? This is something that most believers today do not practice. And the thing is, we, we pray and fast in this church a couple times a year as a group, but I encourage you to do it as individuals as well. Last Sunday, I asked you guys to fast on Monday for my wife's health. But it is just as important today as it, when, when, uh, it was when Jesus made this statement. We're not above this. So as praying plugs us into God, fasting unplugs us from the flesh. It teaches us that we don't need all the things that our flesh tells us we need. When your stomach is growling and you don't feed it, you'll find out missing one meal, you're not going to die. And fasting teaches us that we can learn to depend upon God more than we already do. Now understand this. I'm a horrible faster. I have a high metabolism. I'm ADHD. I'm always moving, always got something going, right? I'm either sleeping or moving, <laughs> right? That's kind of my nature. Or studying. I study a lot too. But anyway, so, so, so man, I'm miserable when I'm fasting, but I still do it. When our girls were growing up, we fasted once a week, my wife and I, for decades or for 18 years. We fasted for our daughters. And man, was I miserable. I'm um, talking about hangry. I was hangry and everything else you could do, you know? And I normally learned afterwards what God was teaching me or get insight. And for me, it's after, after that fat meal where you just like, oh, okay, now God can speak to me, right? You know? But it is a discipline and it's something. Do I completely understand it? Look, I, I don't understand prayer. I got a, I got a doctorate in, in theology. I still don't understand prayer. It's an amazing thing. 
Fasting, I don't completely understand, but I know the Lord says do that, right? And it does, it does focus on the spiritual things. But it's also just a passionate response. If you have something heavy going on in your life, be like Nehemiah. Nehemiah was not like Ezra. Ezra was a priest. Nehemiah was a worker man, an average Joe, right? And when, when uh, Nehemiah was working for the king back in Babylon, and he got a report about Jerusalem, it says, they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And God motivated him to petition the king, go down and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And that's where we get the book of Nehemiah. And so if you're under overwhelming stress, it's a good thing to be able to say, I'm going to fast. And, 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 and somehow it gets you to a place where you have more power. This does not come out. If you're going to battle a demon, be ready. Be updated. Be charged up with the Lord. That is not the moment to mature in your Christian faith. <laughs> you want to be mature going into that trial. And so I would just say to you before we celebrate communion this morning, may your faith be stretched as you grow in these disciplines. May your deepest, or may your dependence and trust in God grow as you pray and fast. And may you be powerful wherever, but more importantly, whenever. That was the issue with these guys. They weren't ready when the Lord wanted to use them. And I want to be ready all the time. I want to be spiritually up to date. I want to be Jesus 5.0 or whatever the newest update is for that day in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we encounter the enemy of our souls, you want to be ready every single day. Let's go ahead and pray as the worship team comes up and we'll celebrate in communion. Dear God, we thank you uh, just for this lesson so appropriate for such a time as this, Lord. And may we be those that are ready. May we be those that are charged by you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.